What's up my fellow knife making friends? Today we're going to be talking about making your own micarta. Now if you clicked on this video you probably already know what micarta is, but if you don't, to summarize, micarta is basically resin impregnated stuff. Actually I believe micarta is a brand name, but the term is so commonly used in the knife making industry it might as well be the stuff that we're going to be making today, which is micarta. And essentially it is stuff that has been impregnated with a resin and cured under pressure in order to make knife handles and other things as well. Now the stuff that I'm referring to is actually anything that the resin will stick to. There's a lot of other videos on YouTube showing you how to make micarta and this is going to be one of those videos. However, I'm also going to be focusing on a lot of the things that the other videos don't really focus on, which is what is the best method to use in order to make micarta. Now this is an extremely messy process, so keep that in mind when you're watching this and that's one of the reasons why um, having the correct method set up and everything in order is important in the first place. Otherwise you could literally end up in a disaster and you'll end up wasting a bunch of money and a lot of time. And to tell you the truth, there was more than one time where I thought to myself, what the heck am I doing making this stuff? I'm having another one of those what the heck are you doing moments. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Now the epoxy resin you plan on using is totally up to you, but there are certain qualities in a resin that you should probably look for. Now the old standard for micarta resin is the 3M Bondo fiberglass resin. And that's fine if you're looking for something relatively cheap, but it's really not an ideal choice. First off, it's not clear. It has a brownish color which will transfer over to your scales. It also sets way too fast. Most likely you're gonna be halfway done when the resin starts to set on you, especially if you're doing bigger pieces. And it smells terrible. It's also not that cheap. You can find it for about $20 a quart, depending on where you buy it. That's about $80 a gallon for something that's not totally ideal. Now the two qualities I'd look for in a resin are slow cure time and something that is clear. Now speaking of epoxy resin, the epoxy resin for today's video was provided by Total Boat. Full disclosure, this was sent to me by Total Boat for use in one of my projects. They contacted me and said, we want to provide you with some epoxy for a project. And I said, I have the perfect project in mind. I will provide a link to their website and a 20% off coupon code in the description below for anybody who is interested in making your own micarta. Now back to the video. So the pan method is basically using a baking pan bought from the dollar store and using the pan as part of the press so that when you clamp everything down, the resin that's squeezed out is caught by the pan and doesn't go all over the floor. Now this pan press thing is made up of two half inch pieces of sanded plywood and some two by fours for the top. Everything is then wrapped in, well, here I'm using wax paper, but parchment paper is a much better choice. Either one will work, but parchment paper just releases much easier. Here I'm simply placing one piece of wrapped plywood into the pan, which I've also lined with wax paper. The second piece of plywood will also be wrapped and used to press everything together. Then the epoxy resin is mixed and you will start layering resin soaked pieces onto the bottom piece of plywood. Now I found out later that it is important to cut all of your pieces of stuff, whatever it is you may be using, all the same size and as accurately as possible. This will help you see whether or not everything is even and lined up when you go to press everything together. The resin soaked pieces have a tendency to walk all over the place when you start pressing everything together. I found this out when attempting to do smaller strips in a different style press. My pieces moved and I didn't have enough width to cut out a clean scale. So all that time and epoxy was wasted. Now you're gonna wanna layer more pieces than you think you will need to meet the desired scale thickness. Here I layer more than I thought I would need and I ended up with a 3 16ths of an inch scale. Not really wide enough. I don't have a good formula to figure out exactly how many layers are needed because with each different material it changes. But it's better to have the scales too thick rather than too thin. Now I'm going to clamp down the top piece of plywood. Now for this method you will need clamps, at least four of them. And the goal here is to clamp everything down as tightly as possible and as evenly as possible. Clamping tightly will help reduce air bubbles, something that is a real concern if you don't have the ability to degas your epoxy in a vacuum chamber. 
guess we'll see what happens. Now, everything was clamped together outside in my workspace, but because it was very cold and epoxy resin doesn't like to cure in cold temperatures, I ended up taking this entire thing inside to a heated space to cure overnight. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, definitely don't let your epoxy cure outside in cold temperatures because it will not cure to the full strength. Now after some hammering and prying, I was able to get everything separated and cut down to size using a chop saw and I was presented with some 3 16ths of an inch scale material. On the surface, everything looked pretty good. And after epoxying it to a screw up knife so I could uh, do some handle shaping with it and see what the finished piece would look like, well, after some sanding, you can kind of see what it looks like. It's okay, it has some blemishes, particularly the dark spot in the middle, but I'll touch on this later. Now I tried making some nylon webbing my car to using the standard wood press made from some scrap wood and some clamps and some steel. There's not much to say about this press other than I'm using the steel to help apply even pressure. Ideally the press would be made out of some sort of aluminum or steel so there wouldn't be any warping or anything going on during clamping. But this is just sort of a proof of concept so I'm using wood. Now the nylon webbing is a very consistent material and it's very easy to work with using the previous steps. It takes the resin really well and is a very consistent width. So all you have to do is make the press walls ever so slightly wider than the webbing, I'd say about an eighth of an inch, as the webbing actually expands slightly when it soaks up the uh, resin. And you wanna make sure that everything fits inside the press after it's all wrapped up. Now essentially what I did was I laid out a piece of wax paper and layered all of the pieces of webbing onto that piece of wax paper. And then once I had the uh, correct number of pieces put together, I then wrapped up the entire thing very tightly and very evenly and placed it into the press. I then clamped everything down as tightly as possible and took it inside where it was warm to cure overnight. Next day, everything came out of the press great. Everything released nice and cleanly other than the wax paper. This is where I said that parchment paper would most likely be a better choice and it absolutely is. Uh, parchment paper does stick a little bit, but definitely not as much as wax paper does. So if you can get your hand on some parchment paper, buy parchment paper and screw the wax paper. And after sanding down the end on the belt sander, here's what the finished edge would sort of look like. I then went over to the bandsaw and cut down two nice little scales. And here are the two finished scales. They're kind of cool looking, I gotta say. They're not completely flat, but honestly, I do think I could make these work on a knife. So the bag method is essentially everything that we have been doing in the past, except this time uh, we're gonna take our fabric pieces and we're gonna cut them up into a bunch of tiny little pieces. We're then gonna take those pieces and place them into a gallon sized plastic bag and then place that entire bag into our press. Now, it doesn't matter really what type of press you're using, whether you're using uh, the pan style press or you're using um, the wood style uh, clamp press that we just used. It doesn't really matter that much because uh, basically we're just pressing everything together inside the plastic bag. Now, theoretically this would help contain a lot of the epoxy and in this case it did, but uh, I would be very careful doing this because that bag can actually build up quite a bit of pressure and if you end up popping the end of the bag with the epoxy starting to squeeze out, you could end up with epoxy literally all over the place. So just something to keep an eye on when you're doing it this way. So the biggest challenge of doing all of these little pieces is coating every single little piece evenly and thoroughly. So you getting big dry globs like this, which is not good. I originally started to mix all of these pieces in a dollar store baking pan and the pan just wasn't big enough and I ended up uh, kind of just dumping epoxy into the bag and dumping a bunch of pieces into the bag and just trying to mix it by hand. I don't really think that this worked super well because I ended up with a bunch of little air pockets and some dry pieces in the middle of this block. What I think would end up working a little bit better is if you had a much larger bucket and you were able to dump uh, the epoxy into that bucket and mix it from there or if you just took the time to coat each piece individually. This is, like I said before, a super pain in the butt to do and you need to be 
uh, mentally ready when you do this. No joke. Uh, halfway through this, I almost gave up and just tossed the whole thing. So fast forward to the next day and this is what our block looks like after it's been cut and lightly sanded with a little bit of oil on it. And you can see all of those air pockets and gaps that we have in that block. Now I actually think that I could salvage this block and use it on a knife if I decided to go ahead and fill all of those air pockets and voids. Uh, but it would be one of those things where I'd have to shape the scales beforehand just to make sure that they were in good enough shape to use. Rather than epoxy them onto the knife and then try and shape the handle and realize that the scales are no good and there's air pockets and dry spots and all kinds of stuff inside the scales. That wouldn't be a fun thing because then I'd have to chisel them off the knife. But I gotta say that this would actually look pretty cool on the right knife. Now, at this point in time, you may be wondering why go to all this trouble to make this stuff? Because to be quite honest, you're gonna spend more money attempting to make your own micarta than you will uh, if you had just gone out and bought yourself a couple of sets of scales. But there is a very good reason that you may wanna do this, and that is customization. And I'm sure by now the wheels may be turning as to what you could possibly come up with uh, to do with this stuff. Got an old t-shirt that has some sentimental value, but you can't wear it anymore. Well, turn it into a knife handle. Now, I also want to say that this is the DIY version of how to make your own micarta. I don't have any of the special equipment for dealing with this stuff, and I'm sure if you're watching this, you don't either. Now, there are better ways to make micarta, but they require professional equipment. Things like presses and vacuum chambers and whatnot. So what exactly is the best way to make your own micarta at home using pretty standard tools and methods? Well, one of the problems is the press itself. I personally didn't like dealing with all the clamps that were involved in trying to finagle them around wet epoxy that's dripping all over the place, um, all the while trying to apply the same exact amount of pressure all the way around. So I thought a new press design was in order. So I sat down and after a lot of thinking and several hours, I ended up coming up with a design that's fairly complicated, but I think it might work. In all seriousness, the press I ended up making is exactly like the drawing. Not much to say about it other than it requires no clamps and it's made from a 2x4. If you're using a 2x4, you want to make the press long enough so that you can cut two scales lengthwise from the finished piece. Now I wanted my finished scales to be about 6 inches long, so I made the press portion slightly longer than double the scale length at 13 inches. This will allow me to trim some off the ends and clean it up somewhat after the epoxy cures. Out of all the DIY press methods, I think this is the easiest and also the cheapest. You can literally make this at the cost of one 2x4 and a couple of bolts if you don't already have the materials sitting around. Now, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail into how to make this, as I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you do make one of these, make sure that you screw it together. Don't nail it or glue it in any way. You want this thing to come apart, as once the epoxy sets, it'll be almost impossible to get it apart if it wasn't able to unscrew. And here's the finished press. Now, the second problem with making your own micarta is dealing with the epoxy resin. I tried a couple of different ways as seen previously, and the easiest way for me was to use a paint tray and a disposable liner for the tray. You can get these at your local hardware store or check the description below for the links. And using a disposable putty knife to spread the epoxy and squeegee it into the material. Now because it was very cold out when I was doing this, the epoxy tended to be somewhat thicker. Even though it was kept inside, it thickened up fairly fast once poured into the pan. If it was warmer out, I'd just use a foam paint roller to roll the epoxy onto the material. Then placing the freshly epoxy pieces onto a layer of parchment paper, making sure to stack it neatly. Now remember, we're making knife handle material here. The more accurate you can be at cutting your pieces, epoxying them together, and laying them out properly, the better your results are going to be. Anything caught between the layers is going to remain there, and it's going to show up in your finished knife handle. So make sure you pull out any of the stray threads and specks of contamination that you may see during the process. After you lay out the pieces, simply wrap them up neatly in the parchment paper and put them into the press. 
Tighten the press down as evenly as possible on both ends and let it dry overnight. The next day, everything came out nicely due to the screw together construction as mentioned earlier, and we have our finished piece. This piece is plenty thick enough for some scales and the air bubbles seem to have been mostly squeezed out. And I think I'm going to get some good scale material with this piece. At this point, it can be cut to size and made into a knife. Now again, this is just a basic way of making your own micarta and more professional methods exist, but this should definitely get you started. So in closing, what is the best method? Well, I do think it's worthwhile making a simple press and not messing around with the clamps. The clamps add complexity to an already messy process. I think if you're gonna be making micarta with random pieces, then using the bag method in combination with the screw together DIY press is gonna be the best combination with a baking pan placed underneath to catch the epoxy. If you're doing layers, again, I'd use a simple screw together press and skip the clamps. I think the first pan press method works, but you have to find some way to add even pressure while keeping the thickness as even as possible. Perhaps for some materials, it may work better, like with paper, which doesn't compress. But for compressible materials, you will get much more consistent results if you use the DIY screw press. See, the thing is, is it's not as straightforward of a process as it may seem. Again, consistency with everything is key here. So dive into my carta making if you dare. I want to again thank Total Boat for providing me with a bunch of epoxy to waste. And as always, I hope this video has been helpful. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask in the comments below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.